You came and broke him down You broke him down And there were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Now feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Back to life and hear the song awaking. All creation singing, we relive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. We shout it out, and we're alive, cause you're alive now. What a love we found, it can't hold us down. We shout it out, and we're alive, cause you're alive. As we see, your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens your love. Your love awakens. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens.
is coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break His broken hearts declare free space For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of this world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb And every knee will bow before so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who of the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of this world. Blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb And every knee will bow before him oh. And every knee will bow Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified died and was buried and descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. church. We're so happy that you can join us for this morning's service. I just want to share a verse with you um, from the Bible. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 says, In Jesus and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So I want to encourage you, whatever kind of week you've had, whatever kind of morning you've had, today God is saying that we can approach Him with freedom and confidence. So stay tuned. This morning's message is going to be incredible and I really believe that God is going to speak to you through it. It's Adam Dodds here, a uh, uh, senior pastor of the Elam Church in Dunedin, and great to be able to speak into where you are in your home, in your lounge, whatever device you're watching on. A uh, particular welcome to the Elam Dunedin Fano, and also a welcome to the wider Elam family, those who might be uh, tuning in, and also those who are not part of Elam or even perhaps the church family at all. It is great that you could join us, and I'm really excited about the message I'm bringing uh, today. This is part two of our series, Kairos an opportune time. I don't know if you've ever bought a foreign currency before, probably not something any of us are going to be doing anytime soon. Uh, but when you buy foreign currency, at least what I do is I, I look at the exchange rate and then I look at the history of the exchange rate and I try to kind of figure out, you know, is this a good time to buy, is this a bad time to buy? And, and then of course when the exchange rate becomes favourable, then I kind of pull the trigger and that's when I try to buy the currency. Well, the time that you do that, in, in Bible terms, you would call that a kairos moment. Uh, there's two Greek words in, in the Bible for time, chronos, which is kind of chronological time, sequential time, and kairos, which is an opportune time, like when you buy a foreign currency. Or maybe it's when you harvest uh, f uh, fruit or something. I love Central Otago, love the fruit in January and February, and that's harvest time for the uh, stone fruit season just beautiful, beautiful food. And so that's a Kairos time. You know, if you miss that time, then you, mi you miss out. It's a little bit like uh, planting garlic. You know, there's the timing you've got to get right. And I've been told you, you plant midwinter, you harvest midsummer, and I'm hoping to get my uh, garden sufficiently prepared that I'm ready uh, for that midwinter timing. Uh, and so that time is a Kairos time. It is an opportune time. And here's the truth. Wise action in a Kairos time makes a disproportionate difference to life. Wise action in a Kairos time makes a disproportionate difference to life. I know for those Central Otago uh, fruit folk, um, if you get a good harvest then and you look after the harvest and you bottle the fruit and store the fruit, it will actually last you for the next 12 months if you take action in that Kairos moment. I remember my wife Kylie and I had a Kairos moment a number of years ago. We were with friends and we went on holiday to the Abel Tasman National Park up near Nelson. And we were kayaking and we were kayaking and then camping on the beach uh, each night. And it was a fantastic holiday. And there was this one moment where we were kayaking kind of around a headland. And that was the bit where it was a little bit more choppy. Uh, that was the bit where the, the water was really deep and there were rocks around. And there was a particular bit which was a little bit nerve wracking uh, where there were rocks on either side and there was a big ocean swell and uh, rather than going all the way around which would have taken a long time the quickest way was to go between these two rocks the problem was it was very shallow and there was a rock underneath and so when the swell was high then you could paddle through quite safely but if you got the timing wrong then you'd end up really scraping the bottom of the boat and possibly doing some serious damage and so I remember sitting there with Kylie we're in a two-person kayak and we were trying to get the timing right you know as the swell comes up as the swell comes down you know to, to go kind of accelerate right now and you start paddling really fast and, and to get that, that right time to go through those rocks, uh, between those rocks through to the other side. And so getting that timing right, that is a Kairos time. And again, wise action during a Kairos time makes an enormous amount of difference, a disproportionate amount of difference to your life. Well, life presents various opportunities uh, to reflect and to reevaluate, you know, 
what, what's my life like and where's my life headed and, and where's my life going and what kind of person am I becoming and who am I investing into? And, and, and I know certainly moments of sickness are times uh, for reflection, they're Kairos moments. Times of being alone are times of Kairos moment of reflection. Um, retreat time, again, time alone, is also a, a Kairos moment for reflection and reevaluation as to the direction of my life. I find that these life moments are moments where we see more clearly. And when we see more clearly, then uh, we can then take action accordingly. These moments are gifts from God, gifts with which we can then draw close to him uh, and we can then make decisions and step into the realization of where we think God is guiding us. And so wise action during these Kairos moments makes an enormous difference to the rest of our life. And most certainly this whole COVID-19 thing that we're in at the moment is one of those Kairos moments, possibly once in a lifetime on this scale. And so a very apt passage to look at in the Bible as we navigate these Kairos moments is the second part of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, Tony brought the message to you last week, looking at the first part, now I'm looking at the second. So would you join me as we read 1 Corinthians 3 from verse 10. By the grace God has given me, Paul is writing, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver and costly stones, wood, hay or straw, we'll come back to that, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, capital D, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping from the flames. And we'll leave it at that passage there. So in this Kairos time, we get to re-evaluate what we are living for, who we are living for, and where our life is going. And as Christians, we don't get a clean slate in this. In other words, we don't get to just make up our life goals in terms of whatever we want. And that's because we are redeemed. We are bought at a price. We belong to an other, Jesus. And so our desire is therefore not to live according to how, whatever we want uh, or are living according to our best desires or our personal preferences or even living according to our imagination and the limits of the imagination but actually we're called to live according to what he calls us to, to live according to his calling. One of my favorite passages in the whole of the Bible, perhaps the favorite passage actually, is in Philippians chapter three. And in, the, in that favorite passage of mine, there's one verse that's really helpful for this moment, which is this, Philippians three, verse 12. Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Which then raises the question, what is it that God has taken hold of your life for? What is it that Jesus has taken hold of your life for? How is God calling you to live for him? For what purpose did Jesus take hold of you? And whatever the answer to that is, that is what you are to devote your energies to, to bend your energies towards and to run after. And I just love that passage. And so Paul talks a bit about that in our main passage, 1 Corinthians 3, where he says, By the grace God gave me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it, verse 10. And so when Paul says this, he's saying, I was given a specific grace. The Greek word is charis, it just means gift. Paul was given a specific gift. What was that? Well, he was an apostle. He was a planter of churches, establishing new church communities, breaking new ground for the kingdom of God. That was the grace that God gave him. That was the purpose for which Jesus took hold of his life. And so that's what Paul grabbed onto and ran towards with all of his energy. And so, of course, what God graces somebody to do, he calls them to do. For Paul, his grace was to plant churches, so that's what he did. And so that raises the question, what specific grace or gift or gifts has God given you? And that's a clue in terms of the things that God wants you to bend your energies towards and run after. 
My wife Kylie is an occupational therapist and if anyone knows uh, an occupational therapist you know it's very hard to define exactly what it is they do because it's such a broad uh, a job in terms of it can do many different things. But the area that Kylie felt really drawn to was helping children with developmental delays to get some areas of breakthrough in their developmental delays so they can then really flourish in life. And with children, if you can help them do that, whether it's you know handwriting or, or reading or social interaction or whatever, if, if they can get some more skills under their belt as a child, it's gonna make the world of difference to the rest of their life. And so during Kylie's studies uh, here in Otago at the Polytech, um, that's the area she felt drawn to. She's been working in that area for a number of years for both private practice and the DHB, the, the health uh, board. But through Kylie's experience, she, she found that th there are different children in different areas who need to be assisted and helped. But in Kylie's opinion, she found that most of the kids that could do with help are actually in the schools. And so she thought that probably the best way to help as many children as possible is to actually train as a teacher, a primary school teacher, so she can go into the schools and, and do a great job, job as a teacher as well, but then use all of her occupational therapy skills to help children through those developmental delays. And so for that reason, she enrolled in a teacher training program with Canterbury University by distance um, a year and a half ago. And so Kylie is a year and a half into her two year course. She's almost through it now. Um, but what I love about what Kylie's doing is it's such a no brainer because when it came to that decision, does she or does she not do further study? It was so clearly an easy decision, of, of course she should, because she knew that for which Christ had taken hold of her, or at least a significant part of that of her life, which was to help kids with the developmental delays. And so she is now pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of her. And again, great thing to discuss at home, great thing to discuss in your home groups. What are some of the things that you think that God has called you to do, that he has taken hold of you for this reason. And then the second question is, are you devoting your life, you're bending your energies to that end? I remember hearing this tragic story uh, recently, just this week actually, of someone who got near the end of their life and then they were confessing something to a, a Christian they trusted and they said that in terms of their life, they really feel like they missed the purpose that God had for them. They felt, felt like they'd missed it. And that is deeply sad, it's deeply tragic. And, and what I wanna say right now is that it is possible, sadly it is very possible, for a person to completely miss out on the purposes for which God created them, the purposes that God had designed for them to do. It is possible for that to happen. And I know I don't wanna miss out on God's purposes for my life. I know I don't want you to miss out on God's purposes for your life. And I'm sure you don't want to miss out on God's purposes for your life either. And so are you seizing this Kairos time to talk to the Lord and also close friends about the direction your life is heading in? And this applies to various areas of our life, um, including wanting God's best for our families. And I remember a time when Kylie and I were in London a few years ago. We were living in Waverley at the time in Dunedin, but we were on holiday uh, with my, in my parents' house in London. And uh, it was summertime there, UK summer. It was lovely warm weather. You know, people in New Zealand seem to be convinced that England is always cold and always gray. It is not true. It can be like that, but on this occasion, it was beautiful weather. And my parents' garden um, is just outside of the house. And so there's double doors from the kitchen. There's double doors from the lounge, both of them leading out onto the same garden. And Kylie and I observed how much our kids just loved running in and out. They loved playing in the garden and running inside and the ease with which they could do that while we were sitting inside, chilling out, relaxing, you know, having a coffee or whatever. And that was a real Eureka moment. It was actually a real Kairos moment for us because where we lived in Waverley, we had a two-story house. And because of that, where our lounge was, was nowhere near where the garden was. So if our kids wanted to play outside, we actually couldn't stay in the lounge. We'd had to go down with them. And, and, and the, the whole indoor-outdoor flow thing and the quality of life and the happiness that we saw in our children, and it made a significant difference to their mood. Uh, let me tell you, <laughs> I won't go into that anymore. Um, but it really did. 
where we just thought, oh my goodness, we need this for our kids. And Carly had already been talking about it, uh, as often is the case with husband and wife. Often the wife gets it first and the husband catches up a bit later. That's what happened with us. And in, in that summer in London, we realized we need to move house. We need to move somewhere that has that kind of indoor outdoor flow thing going on. Doesn't matter if it's a nice house or not, it's irrelevant. We just need that for our kids' quality of life. So on returning back to New Zealand, back home here, um, within six months, we'd sold our house. We'd moved to Mosgiel, we were living in a rental and we're in the uh, process of building a new place, uh, which we now of course live in. And so that, that time of reflection, of time out, if you like, when we were in my parents' house in London was a real Kairos moment. And an action made in a Kairos moment makes a disproportionate difference to the rest of your life. And we're so glad that we've done that. And, and the quality of life for our kids now is so much higher than it would have been before. Nothing against Waverley, just sharing where we're at and where we're coming from. And so, yeah, I just wanna ask you if you've invited God into this Kairos moment in terms of where your life is heading. And if you have, I just wanna say, that's awesome. Just keep going, just keep doing it. And if you haven't already, invite uh, those close to you into that processing as well, into the talking about reflecting. Uh, this is the time for that. And if you haven't done either of those things, I urge you to start because this COVID-19 thing is potentially a once in a lifetime Kairos moment. And so we don't want to waste that moment. As tragic as it is in so many ways, it's also an opportunity, which I don't think God wants us to miss. Verse 11 says, uh, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so when you think of that foundation of our lives, the foundation of a building to some degree determines what the rest of the building above ground is going to be like. And so Jesus is to us. And so Jesus is not like just an optional extra that we add on to our life. He's not just like an extra room that we decide to build onto the house. He's not like a, you know, a garden shed that we choose to construct or a deck that we choose to put on uh, to the side of our lounge or something. He is the foundation of our lives. And what that means is that he gets to determine the shape of the rest of our lives. And so with that in mind, let's read from verse 12 again. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, and straw, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping from the flames. So I think what this passage is saying here is in terms of the building, the different materials, that building are those things in our lives that we devote our energy toward, that we devote our time and invest our time into. And I love the quote from John Blanchard. He says, time should not be spent. It should be invested in the kingdom of God. Scholars note that the word kairos is one of the main words associated with the end times. And here we see reference to that in that passage. In verse 13, Paul talks about the day. And that day refers to the day of judgment, when all human beings will have to stand before God and give an account of how we've lived our lives. You know, it's true that, that your life is God's gift to you and how you live it is your gift back to him. And we're not owners of our lives, we're stewards of our lives, we're curators of our lives and we'll have to give an account to the Lord on that day. Now, in terms of uh, the final judgment, I know that's a heavy topic, but it's very, very serious and important. And, and if there's ever a time to think about these things, now is that time, I think. And so um, it means a couple of things. Firstly, uh, for those who are Christians and those who are not followers of Jesus, that that's the big deal. That's the biggest deal of all, which is, will we, you know, God will ask, have you accepted the provision of salvation that I've made for you in, in my son, Jesus? And we'll have to answer yes or no. And so in terms of that question, we'll come back to that toward the end of my message. But that's the big one. But Paul here is writing to Christians, to those who've already said yes to Jesus, they're already following him. And so the question for us is how will we build our lives? How will we direct our energies in our life? What will we live for? And there are two groups of people that we see in this passage, those that will experience reward 
and those that will suffer great loss and they will be saved but it will be as if kind of a brand plucked from the flames quite strong language that Paul uses so one question you could ask yourself in this time is are you happy with your Christian life and that's that's not a bad question I think a better question is this is Jesus happy with your Christian life and the truth is this is that if you're living in known disobedience then the answer is no and and I think sometimes we can get confused on this don't don't be confused Jesus loves you God loves you no question about it 100% yes he loves you but that doesn't necessarily mean he's happy with how we're choosing to live they're two quite different things and so the question is is Jesus happy with my Christian life with your Christian life and brothers and sisters I know this is serious stuff I get it I do and I feel like one of my key roles in, in my role my the honor that I get to have as a senior pastor is to help all of us set us up to win so when we come to that day as we all will I'll feel like you know what we, I've set us up to win we're on the right track we've all got a good shot of standing before the Lord and saying you know what Lord I think I did I think I did do those things that you called me to do didn't do it perfectly I know that wasted some time I know that but Lord I, I think I did on the big things I think I think I hit the mark and that's my heart that's my prayer and that's my desire for you and it's certainly my desire for me and I'm sure it's your desire for you as well you may have heard this before but there's a sadly a true story of an elderly gentleman who uh, in the UK near London who was driving to see his daughter his daughter lived about an hour's drive away about 55 miles away and um, so he set off to see his daughter after he didn't arrive and many hours had passed uh, the police were alerted and let's just take a moment thank the Lord for the police man what they do is so important and if you're involved in the police in any way we honor you and we pray God's richest blessing on you and we thank you for all that you're doing particularly in this time of COVID-19 you know what you're doing keeps the rest of us safe and so we're grateful Okay, back to the story. Um, so the police were alerted in different police forces around London uh, to look out for this gentleman. And it turns out that uh, then he tr triggered a, a camera, uh, a traffic camera, not a speed camera, just a traffic camera. And his car was spotted six miles from his daughter's house. Uh, but people weren't able to find him. The police kept looking for him. And after two days, they finally found him. And he had not yet arrived at his daughter's house. And the thing is, is that he was driving on the M25 and the M25 is a circular motorway around Greater London. And so once you get on the M25, you can drive forever because you're driving in one very big circle. And that's effectively what he did. And then I came across another story of a different gentleman who was taking his wife to the airport and it was a 120 mile round trip. So, you know, two or three hours at, at most. Um, he ended up driving... 2,000 miles over three days uh, before he made his way home because he got lost on the way. Both true stories. Now clearly these stories are really sad, they're really tragic. You kind of, do you laugh, do you cry? Just, they're very sad. Um, and the point of these stories is not men need to ask for directions. <laughs> That's not the point of the story, but that is true. Um, and maybe these, uh, these men did not ask for directions out of pride, out of not wanting to admit that they actually needed help. But this isn't unique to men. Everyone gets lost in life at one time or another. Some of us get lost in life for long periods of time. And so all of us need to stop and ask for help relatively often. I think that is wise. That's why the Bible talks about there's wisdom and wise counsel. And so I think God wants us to regularly check in with him daily. That's what prayer times are about. But checking in with our Heavenly Father, checking in with our commanding officer, if you like, about, Lord, am I headed in the right direction or do I need to make a course adjustment? And can I submit to you that to not do so is actually foolish? And we may end up driving around and around and around, not for a few days, but potentially for a few years or a few decades. We're in a Kairos moment right now. The decisions we make now in this Kairos time, this pandemic time, could make a significant difference for the shape of the rest of our lives. So in life right now, are you running around in circles? Is life a little bit like a hamster wheel that you're running really fast, but you're not really getting anywhere? 
Um, or maybe you are actually moving at quite a good speed, but you may not be headed in the right direction. Well, you can kind of stubbornly keep driving, just you know, telling yourself you're doing the right thing, or you can stop and check with those that you trust. Check in with the Lord, pray and say, Lord, are you happy with the direction of my life? So what do the wood, hay and straw represent? I think they represent the things that we devote our energies to, the things that we invest our time into that from an eternal perspective are worthless. And the imagery of fire that is used is uh, the fact that wood, hay and straw will be burned up. There's nothing durable, there's nothing imperishable about them. They will simply cease to be. And so those, that represents those things in our lives that God is saying, hey, I think you need to stop that. And so my question for all of us today, for you today, are there things that God is saying, hey, that in your life, that's wood, hay and straw. Time to stop that. Are there things that changes that God is asking you to make? Then there are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. What do they represent? Well, they clearly represent things that we devote our energies to that are imperishable, that last, so that when the, that purifying fire comes, and the fire of judgment is primarily a purifying fire. You know, that's how, how metal is refined, is there's a fire that gets rid of the rubbish so that the good stuff remains. That's what it's talking about here. So the gold, silver, and precious stones represent imperishable things, things that last, things that have value from an eternal perspective. And what are those things? I think primarily they are when we invest in the lives of other people. That is something that lasts, that is something that remains. And so what are some of those things that you're doing that the Lord is encouraging you to continue in because they're really important? It'd be a great thing to talk about in your home group, be a great thing to talk about um, in your house and with those close to you. Now, like many people for my job, and, and I'm true for so many other jobs as well, you know, I could probably say that most of what I do is investing in the lives of other people, and many others could say that as well, and that is good and that is important. But if we're really clear about it and really transparent about it, there's probably only very few people that I deeply invest my life into. There's probably very few people who really know what's going on in my inner world. And, and there's only a few people where I know what's really going on in their inner world. And I think God is calling us to invest in some people in that way, not just in a general sense, which is good and important, but also for all of us to invest in a few people in, in, in quite an in-depth kind of way. And ultimately, that's a picture of what it means to make disciples. And I've got a discipleship coach called Bill. He lives in the States, and we uh, Zoom chat monthly. We actually Zoom chatted earlier this morning. Um, and he challenged me on this a little while ago. And he said, Adam, I know that you could probably argue that most of what you do in your job is making disciples. But I want to challenge you, he said, to tithe, to give 10% of your time specifically to invest deeply in the lives of other people. Not from a distance, but life overlapping life. And I thought, oh, here's a challenge. But I took that challenge and I've been trying to live accordingly. But I believe that's not unique to me. I think Jesus made it clear that all of us are to be people who make disciples and to live in deliberately transparent relationships with one or two or a few other people. And so then you could ask the question, well, how do you do that? How do you actually make disciples? Can I just say, anyone who's asking that question, yes! That is one of the most important questions you could ever ask. And oh, that's where God is leading us as a church. And I'm just excited that you're asking that question. Today, I'm gonna to give a brief answer. There's far more that can be said and we'll do that another time. But yeah, just to, uh, to answer that question briefly, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10, the apostle Paul says, but you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, you know my patience, my love, and my endurance. Okay, let's pause there. Paul is saying to Timothy, you know how I live. Well, how would Timothy know that? How would Timothy know how Paul spent his time, how he interacted with other people, what goes on in his inner world? Timothy would only know that if he lived in close proximity to Paul. If, if I can use this language, which we're now familiar with, they lived in the same bubble 
We've been talking a lot about that in the pandemic, rightly so. Timothy must have shared Paul's bubble, not necessarily every day, but certainly regularly enough. You know, I, I've loved that in level three, we can expand our bubbles a bit. Uh, and hopefully by the time this airs, we'll be on level two, hopefully. Um, but we've expanded our bubbles to my mother-in-law and her boyfriend, and, and it's just great. We've seen them a couple of times already. And so maybe expanding your bubble just means seeing someone a couple of times a week. Doesn't mean you have to live with them. Well, Timothy clearly lived in Paul's bubble. How would Timothy know Paul's patience? How would Timothy know what Paul was like when he was frustrated? Because he lived in Paul's bubble. Paul said to Timothy, you know my faith. That includes the things that Paul prays for, the things that Paul is passionate about. How would Timothy know that? Because he lived in Paul's bubble. He probably heard him praying through the thin wall in the next door room, whether he lived in the same house or not. I love the Passion Translation on this. Gets it really good. Uh, so same verse, but from the Passion Translation. But you, Timothy, have closely followed my example and the truth I've imparted to you. You have modeled your life after the love and endurance I've demonstrated in my ministry by not giving up. The faith you now have, the faith I have, you now have. What I have hungered for in life has now become your longing as well. The patience I have with others, you now demonstrate. Yes. And so there's this close proximity of life on life, of actually sharing real life, of what's really going on on the inside and championing one another on and spurring each other on and calling each other forward into the things that Jesus has for us. And so if, if for a moment we can just set aside uh, COVID-19 just for a moment, so I'm not referring to that, will you expand your life bubble to include one or two other people for three months or maybe up to three years or somewhere in that range? Will you expand your life bubble? I think that is the beginning of how to make disciples. As a church, this is where we're going. This is what we're shooting for. This is our bullseye. This is what we're aiming for. Why? Because it's the embodiment of love, because it's what Jesus modeled, it's what Jesus commanded, and because it's the primary way through which Jesus transforms people's lives for his glory and for their good. And so I don't know where you're at in relation to the, to the whole making disciples thing, but let me just share a couple of thoughts. Perhaps you're not quite sure where to start. And so if that's the case, can I encourage you to join a home church and then you can actually be discipled, be on the receiving end, so you then learn also how to then make disciples yourself. Or maybe there's one or two people you can think of, pray about who that might be, and maybe approach them and say, hey, would you consider discipling me? That's a great way to start. Or maybe that you're not, in that case, if you wanna be discipled, maybe you're actually good to go. If that's the case, awesome, go for it. Ask someone for help if you need some assistance in how to go about it, and we as pastors are here for you to help as well. Or well, perhaps you're listening to this message and actually this all sounds great, but you only kind of know of Jesus from a distance. You don't actually know him in your heart. You recognize that life gives Kairos moments and this is a significant one. And you have been reevaluating your life and you recognize that actually you do need to get right with God and you do need to get with his program for your life rather than doing your own thing. And so if that's you, I'd, I'd love, I count it an honor if I could lead you in a prayer on, on what to do with that. And so if you're in that state and you go, you know what, I actually need to live for Jesus. I would love it if you could join with me right now and pray out loud in your heart, leave it up to you. But would you join with me in prayer right now? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are good, that you reveal what God is like and, and you reveal that God is for me and not against me. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you lived a human life, the perfect human life. But Lord, you also died on a cross. Lord, to deal with sin, all the things that I've ever thought, said and done that are wrong, on the cross you dealt with them all once and for all. And Lord, you offer me forgiveness of sins. You offer me eternal life. And so Jesus, I'm here and I wanna say, yes, I receive your forgiveness. I receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus, I wanna follow you from this point forward. Be my Lord and be my savior. Holy Spirit, come and fill me from this point forward that I may not live for myself, but I may live for Jesus and run after his purposes for my life. So Lord Jesus, would you accept me now? In your name I pray, amen. Oh, if you pray that prayer, that is awesome. 
strongly encourage you to get in touch with a Christian that you know or get in touch with us at, at Elam Dunedin. Love to hear from you and we can help you on your next steps. God bless.
Now we're gonna take up the offering. So this is our opportunity to give back to God, to honor Him um, with the first fruits of what we've been given. Um, if your income has changed because of this pandemic, then we encourage you to adjust your giving um, in proportion to your change in income. If you wanna find out some more information about how to give electronically, you can go to our website, www.elimdunedin.com. So the next steps, what is this message encouraging you? How is God leading you? What's this next step look like for you to become more like Jesus? We really encourage you, um, if you're not yet part of a small group or a home church group, then please sign up today. It's an incredible way to grow as a community, encourage one another and be able to work out what this next step is together so that we can become more like Jesus. You can find out how to join a home church online at the elamdunedin.com website. Um, you can even put in the comments on this Facebook feed just the word home church um, and someone can get in contact with you for that. Maybe another next step, if you're not yet um, a follower of Jesus, you want to know a little bit more about who Jesus is, we'd love to um, chat with you and walk with you in that journey. So you can, um, there'll be a, a phone number to contact in the comments, you can look for that, or you can get in touch with us um, via Messenger. We'd love to talk with you through that. If you have made a decision today to put your trust in Jesus and follow Him, we'd love to know about that too. Maybe you could tell a, a Christian friend or you can let us know in the comments. We'd love to walk with you in that journey. Anyway, have an amazing week. I just pray um, that God will bless you this week and He will use you to be a blessing to others. Have an amazing week as we become more like Jesus.